back as soon as you can, <laughs> which I, I, I did. did about. Okay. Well, you know, we run on time, and we're out of time. Thank, Thank you so much, much. Bishop-elect. Great to see you, as always. God bless, and, and we, we, we pray for you, and we're we'll, sure you'll be a wonderful uh, auxiliary in the Archdiocese. I'm sure you will. Of course, speaking here with uh, Bishop-elect Reed, now we take you to a very special documentary on the founder of the Knights of Columbus, Father Michael McGivney, followed by another program produced by the Knights in, entitled Beyond Borders. His name is Father Michael McGivney. He was a parish priest from a small town in Connecticut. But this humble cleric could soon be proclaimed a saint and be recognized as one of the most highly esteemed holy men ever to have been born in the United States. Should he be canonized, Father McGivney will be the very first American-born parish priest to be declared a saint of the Roman Catholic Church. Father McGivney was a deeply spiritual man with a great love for his fellow man. Father McGivney really gave the Knights of Columbus uh, its spiritual center and core. He had enough vision to say, we have to establish something that's going to go on. Father McGivney found a way of bringing others into his way of serving others so that there was a legacy of continuing his ministry long beyond his lifetime. Father Michael McGivney may not be a household name, but for nearly two million men around the world, he is a person deeply revered. This is really a visionary person who sees into the future. Almost a century before the Second Vatican Council, Father McGivney saw the need for the laity to step up and have a greater role in the work of the church and in the renewal of society. He is the founder of one of the largest fraternal societies in the world, begun by less than two dozen men in the basement of a church in New Haven, Connecticut. The Knights of Columbus. The story of Father McGivney begins over 125 years ago in a troubled time torn by violence, prejudice, and hate. Mid-19th century America. The population is rapidly changing as an unprecedented number of Irish immigrants escape to America, fleeing a dreadful potato blight. Ireland had fallen into a terrible state uh, literally a million people had died of starvation, and another million and a half plus uh, emigrated for other places because life in Ireland had become so intolerable. The 19th century saw a tremendous influx of immigrants. Many of them, if not most of them, were Catholic. And so they brought with them a religion that was thought to be anti-democratic, they brought with them an allegiance to the Holy Father in Rome, and these teeming masses were thought to be a threat to the established order. Catholics and the Pope are the Antichrist! There is an intense amount of hatred of Catholics in the United States, and it's kind of been swept under the doormat of history. If you take a close look at it, you'll find that Catholics were often killed for being Catholic, that they were ostracized in communities across the United States. Their churches were burned. It is into this world of hate and prejudice that Michael McGivney is born in Waterbury, Connecticut in 1852. His parents were both immigrants, and they both came at the time of the famine. And they came actually from the same county, County Cabin. They moved to Waterbury and met there and married. 
McGivney's story is the story of all immigrant families. Feared, despised, distrusted, they tried desperately to scratch out a new life in a new world, clinging to each other and to their faith for support. From colonial times, the Catholics were a minority. This was particularly true in Connecticut, where the Congregational Church was actually the established church uh, long after the United States had come into being. In 1855, when Michael is just a child, a powerful new figure enters the lives of the McGivney family. He will bring light and hope to their troubled world and have a huge influence on Michael's future. His name is Father Thomas Hendrickson, a native of Ireland who has been tapped to lead the Catholic Church in Waterbury. Father Hendrickson was a large, imposing man who had a tremendous force of personality. The local Catholic population has grown to such a size that on Sundays, Hendrickson's small church is packed to the rafters. People had to uh, gather outside the walls of the church because there was no room left inside. And when it was cold and wet and rainy, they'd knelt in the mud or in the snow uh, in order to assist at mass. So Hendrickson raises money and builds a new church large enough to accommodate his flock. He turns the old church building into the East Main Street Grade School. It teaches the hundred or so children in the town lucky enough to be given an education. Father Michael was a graduate of grammar school, which was quite unusual. I believe there are eight or nine children in his graduating class. This is the time when Waterbury's population was between 15 and 20,000. So very few children went to school. For the McGivneys, East Main Street is a godsend. Patrick and Mary are ambitious for their children, teaching them at home before they are old enough to start school. When Michael is just six years old, he sits for the entrance exam and does so well, he is allowed to skip two grades. Michael is a very bright boy who excels at his studies. He graduates at 13, three years before the other children of his age. As the oldest son, he's a natural leader and he looks up to Father Hendrickson. Michael McGivney saw in Father Hendrickson the kind of priest who would take charge, get things done, and do what needed to be done. Inspired by Father Hendrickson, Michael decides that he too wants to be a priest. The oral tradition is that his father was a little hesitant about this. But there's really no historical records to say that. But that's pretty much what the family says. Um, and it was his parish priest, Father Hendrickson, who encouraged him by helping him to figure out how he could get enough education to enter the seminary. Michael takes a job in a local factory making spoons. But Father Hendrickson believes that Michael should not give up on his desire to become a priest. He saw young Michael J. McGivney and saw that he was a, a hard-working boy, that he was a, a religious boy, and somebody who would be apt to the priesthood. It was Father Hendrickson's guidance which overcame Patrick's concern. Father Hendrickson was a model pastor of his time, and he saw in the young Michael McGivney a special individual who had greatness within him and a future that could really make a contribution. In September of 1868, 16-year-old Michael leaves the factory and heads to St. Hyacinth Seminary in Quebec to begin his studies. It is a far tougher challenge than his grade school. The seminary demands a mastery of Latin and French and an understanding of ancient Greek Michael hasn't studied in three years, and he's miles away from home with none of his friends and family there to support him. 
and it was a struggle for him. There was a difficult transition, a rude awakening, so to speak. It took him time to basically get into the swing of, of academics. Despite this initial challenge, Michael quickly masters his studies. Over the next four years, he changes seminary twice, and along the way discovers that sports activities provide some much needed relaxation. Mike McGivney was a natural athlete. One of the things he found out in seminary was not only did he like baseball, but he played it very well. And this kind of teamwork and team spirit stayed with him uh, throughout the rest of his life. Sports help give Michael the concentration he needs to apply himself to his studies. And at the Jesuit College of St. Marie in Montreal, he decides to follow his love of learning and become a priest of the Society of Jesus. But it is not to be. On June 6, 1873, Michael's father dies. He is only 48 years old. Michael immediately leaves Montreal without taking his final exams to come home and rejoin his family. He leaves behind his dream of becoming a Jesuit. He came home to be with his mother, to be with his younger brothers and younger sisters, my great-grandmother being one of them. But Michael will not stay at home for long. Once his father was buried and, and, and the dust settled, it was agreed by the family that he should continue his priestly education. Michael is ready to resume his studies for the priesthood, but faces a big change with his vocation. The Bishop of Hartford intervenes and arranges for Michael to complete his studies, but not as a Jesuit. He is to finish his studies with the Order of St. Sulpice in Baltimore and become a parish priest. What they do is uh, teach a form of uh, study for the priesthood that emphasizes evangelization and holiness and devotion to parish life. This is a decisive turning point in the life of Father McGivney, moving from the vocation to the Jesuits to the vocation to be a parish priest. This puts him in solidarity in a special way with the working families of his time, and without this, it's hard to see the Knights of Columbus ever coming into existence. In 1877, Michael McGivney is ordained by Archbishop James Gibbons at a ceremony at the Cathedral of the Assumption in Baltimore. The ordination of Father McGivney by Archbishop Gibbons is providential. First, because Gibbons is going to play such a crucial role in the history of the Catholic Church in the 19th century. Michael is appointed curate of St. Mary's Church in New Haven, Connecticut. For Michael, it is a homecoming, a chance to be around his family once again. Recently constructed, St. Mary's was designed to be a sumptuous structure. The original church that had been built 50 years earlier was dilapidated and not big enough, and so they had built a big, new, uh, wonderful Gothic church, very solid, large enough for this big congregation. It is a jewel amongst Connecticut churches, with its gracious medieval-style vaulting, its magnificent altar and lofty stained glass windows. Its grandeur matched the growing size and importance of the Catholic population in New Haven. In his new position at St. Mary's, Father McGivney quickly finds he has his work cut out for him. He was the number two guy behind a young priest, but had already had a pretty tough time of it. Uh, he had a very large congregation. Father McGivney's arrival was a godsend for him. St. Mary's priest, Father Patrick Murphy, is only 32 years old, but he is ailing like a man twice his age. Father McGivney quickly finds himself doing the work of two men. Behind St. Mary's towering facade is a big building with big problems. It was $200,000 in debt, which in today's dollars was probably close to $15 million. That's a huge debt. It's gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. But it was way beyond the means of the Irish immigrants that made up the, the community. And 
They just didn't have the money to pay for it. In addition to the financial problems, St. Mary's has another burden to bear. New Haven is uh, a town that had been dominated by Protestants from the earliest days, and they did not take very well to this uh, big Catholic church on Hill House Avenue, which is one of the most elegant and well thought of avenues in the entire city. And oh my gosh, they put a Catholic church there? How dare they? When they built St. Mary's Church, the New York Times on the front page ran a story condemning it as a blight in a prominent neighborhood. New Haven during Father McGivney's lifetime was one of these tough New England industrial cities with teamsters, factory workers, warehousemen. These were the people that were in Father McGivney's parish. He came out of that environment in Waterbury. And the people saw in Father McGivney a man like themselves who cared about them and cared about their needs. Despite having several thousand members, St. Mary's is still stretched to its limits. So Father McGivney sets about making St. Mary's more than a place to go on Sunday. He gathers the men in the congregation in games of baseball and sets up social times for the women quickly making the church the center of community life. He even becomes popular with the teenagers and young adults. He made it an entire community. He organized uh, events of all sorts, athletic events, social events, dances, plays. Father McGivney did not simply stay within the confines of the parish property. He was a man who went out and reached out to his parishioners McGivney transforms St. Mary's from a struggling pariah into the lively hub of a vibrant Catholic community. They had a coffee hour. They made $400 in the coffee hour. All of that went into, the, into reducing the debt. St. Mary's became a model of what a church should be, and he became a model of the parish priest. Father McGivney was the quintessential parish priest. Um, he was, of course, a talented man. He was a determined man. Uh, he was a natural leader. Father McGivney's time at St. Mary's was like a love affair. He came here and it was like magic. They took him into their hearts and he loved them just tremendously. McGivney's energy and enthusiasm began to help fill both the pews and the collection plate. But worry about the church's huge debt has taken a permanent toll on Father Murphy. He was apparently in, in poor health to begin with, and he basically worked himself into an early grave. On May 19, 1879, Father Patrick Murphy dies of typhoid malaria. He is only 34 years old. Within just a few years, Michael McGivney has been devastated by the early deaths of two important men in his life. First his father, and now Father Murphy. He knows that this is only too common an occurrence in the Irish immigrant communities around him. Health standards were not uh, what they are today. People died of a wide variety of things. They uh, died of uh, typhoid, they died of tuberculosis, died of malaria. Many of our Catholic immigrants were working in factories that were perhaps not so well uh, from a safety standpoint, and many times the father of the breadwinner of the household, you know, passed away or was, was injured and died. When a breadwinner dies, the consequences are catastrophic. Bankruptcy, poverty, and families torn apart. Father McGivney not only understood the hardships of these thousands of immigrant families, he actually lived them as a young man, and he was determined to make life better for these families. He found a way to channel the energy and resources of what would become thousands and even millions of men in trying to do the same thing. The real challenge that uh, Father McGivney sought to address was the plight of widows and children uh, when the father of the family died or became incapacitated. In those days, uh, there was not burial insurance. 
the benefits were very, very meager. And in, in the event that the breadwinner died, which was the case back in those days, the widows and the children were impoverished. Deeply aware of this grievous problem, Father McGivney will soon be personally involved with one family's tragedy, an experience that will set him on a course to help thousands of widows and orphans across America. The Downs are a middle-class Irish-American family in New Haven. They have lifted themselves up by their bootstraps and now make a comfortable living with a newspaper stand on the green across from Yale University. But in the late 1870s, an economic crisis robs the family of their wealth. Within months, they are forced to sell their store and their home and barely avoid bankruptcy. It is a blow the father never recovers from. Mr. Downs died suddenly. And in a sense, the world fell apart for the widow and for the children. There was no security. There was no breadwinner. And as the situation went from bad to worse, the court, by and by, intervened. With no government agency to provide support, the widow Catherine Downs is left working odd jobs to make ends meet. When a breadwinner died, the situation was critical because the courts would step in immediately and see if the widow had the financial means to continue to support the children. And if not, the family would be divided up, children placed in institutions or foster care. Father McGivney counsels the family but there was little he can do to save them from disaster. The courts required that each child would be accounted for by someone who could post a bond. And the Downs family managed to do that with all except one son. 19-year-old Alfred is left without a bond. The Downs' many friends in the community, all the connections built up being in business, people walked away one by one. The New Haven probate court must meet to decide Alfred's fate. Father Michael J. McGivney stood up in the back of the courtroom and said, I'll take him. This is an extraordinary moment for Father McGivney because he's stepping far beyond the normal role of a Catholic priest and he's putting himself at considerable personal risk in the judicial system. Father McGivney was there. He stood up. He took the responsibility. Just goes to show you, there's nothing more practical than falling in love with God. Because falling in love with God enables you to do practical acts of charity for others. Father McGivney's intervention saves the Downs family but he is only one man, and there are so many families in need. This kind of thing was going on all the time in the 19th century. Families being broken up, either by death, sometimes by abandonment by the father, very often by just poverty. And it was a very common thing that children were put before the court to be answered for. Father McGivney sees that much more must be done to save families like the Downs. Father McGivney's experience with the Downs family drove home two essential points. First, that he could make a tremendous difference in the life of a family. But secondly, he could not personally make that difference in the thousands of families that needed that kind of help. A bigger vehicle, a bigger way had to be found. Adding to the problems are secret fraternal societies whose promises of increased job opportunities and a sense of belonging attract men, pulling them away from the church community. Membership in a fraternity meant that you would get a better job or you'd get a promotion. You'd have opportunities. In the late 19th century, a men would leave the church, left the church in droves. They would join secret societies. The Catholic leadership views these secret fraternal societies with unease. Not only are they drawing men away from the church, some are overtly anti-Catholic. But Father McGivney realizes that the societies provide real economic benefits to their members, and he begins to think about a new twist on the idea. Father McGivney was looking for a way 
to have such an association, but one which was founded on Catholic principles that would appeal to Catholic men and could serve to deepen their religious life. During the early fall of 1881, Father McGivney speaks to the men of his parish and invites them to a meeting to be held in the basement of St. Mary's. The date is October 2nd. Two dozen men attend. Father McGivney suggested Sons of Columbus for this new organization. And here's a stroke of genius as well, because at the time, Catholics were considered unpatriotic and foreigners. And yet Columbus was a true American hero. He was also Catholic. Back in the 19th century, Columbus was as big as Washington. One of the men, James Mullen, a Civil War veteran, suggested the name Knights of Columbus. Maybe it's a touch of 19th century romanticism, but it still strikes an important chord. Those knightly virtues of standing up for what is right, of helping the weak, of protecting those who can't protect themselves. It was the, the men themselves that wanted knights because it spoke in the 19th century of such heroism and bravery and virtue. When things get tough, there's a crisis, what better image? than the knight in shining armor coming over the horizon. The members agree to be bound by a code of spiritual principles that will guide their lives as good Catholic men. Father McGivney named the two fundamental principles as unity and charity. And that gradually got broadened to unity, charity, fraternity. What he was doing in creating the Knights of Columbus was designing from the ground up a society that would bind men to their faith and provide the kinds of fraternal camaraderie that the other societies offer. But to begin with, McGivney sees the Knights of Columbus primarily as a mutual death benefit society, there to hand out money to widows and orphans. But he also knew that if this organization was to thrive, that he really had to get it on a found, sound financial basis. So much so did he believe in this that he became the first financial secretary. But Father McGivney is very clear from the start that the Knights will not be like other fraternities. When the Knights got created, he said, we're not going to be like the Masons. The Masons are a secret society. The Knights of Columbus will be open there would be one other important difference. Unlike other Catholic organizations of the time, which were all an integral part of the church, it would be authentically Catholic, but independent of the church. Father McGivney makes an extraordinary decision in insisting that laity be the leaders of this new organization, and not himself, or not a priest, or a bishop. Now, this is unprecedented in the Catholic Church. Father McGivney has great plans for the Knights, but he knows they will go nowhere without the support of the Church. And in the late 19th century, 80 years before the Second Vatican Council, will dramatically transform the role of the laity in the Catholic Church. He realizes it is an unheard of and potentially risky venture. He was a visionary in his own way, whether he was intending to, to uh, found the whole system of of uh, using lay people as something that perhaps historians will have to determine. But he was doing it in a marvelous way, and one that was worthy of uh, being copied and speaking back 40 years, the Second Vatican Council uh, endorsed it. I just marvel that somebody in the 19th century, a Roman Catholic priest, could found an organization completely run by lay people, when the priest was everything. And as Father McGivney struggles to help the Knights grow and survive, his life becomes entwined with the fate of one young man whose story illustrates all too painfully the desperate need for a Catholic fraternity. James Chip Smith is an unemployed man in his early 20s, living in Ansonia, a few miles west of New Haven. He has the reputation of being a bit of a ruffian with a weakness for liquor. Chip Smith was a young man who was, like so many others at the time, fond of drinking, 
and fond of misbehaving once he'd been doing some drinking. In late December of 1880, the local police receive word that an intoxicated Chip is causing a disturbance. Chip's father begs the chief of police, Daniel Hayes, to take Smith into custody to keep him out of trouble. Chip Smith was the stereotypical example of what happened to a lot of young Irish immigrants. They would get frustrated by being shut out of all employment possibilities or advancement, and their resentment would grow against the establishment, and then they would blow. Hayes went to arrest Smith. There was a struggle. There apparently was some bad blood between the two. The pistol went off and wounded Hayes. Hayes, nevertheless, was able to take him into custody, bring him to the police station. Once he got him into the jail, he got virulent died. Smith stands trial for murder in the criminal court in New Haven. Counsel, you may bring your first witness. His lawyer pleads that Chip is a man of diminished capacity. He's simple or slightly demented and was extremely drunk. He argues that when the struggle occurred, the gun must have gone off accidentally, so it couldn't possibly have been murder. But the judge and jury are unconvinced. Smith is found guilty. This court sentences you, James Smith, to be confined to the county prison until the date of your execution, when you shall be hanged by the neck until death. It's the big news story of the year in Connecticut. Many are conflicted about the verdict. Father McGivney is moved by Smith's plight. The convicted prisoner is Irish and a lapsed Catholic. So McGivney becomes a regular visitor to the jailhouse. Father McGivney, as a parish priest, did not simply minister to those to whom it was easy to minister. He uh, truly reached out to everyone, including those whom the community at large, or society at large, had given up on. One was Chip Smith. It was some time with Father Mike going back many times for Chip Smith to finally welcome him. Smith's lawyer appeals the sentence. Smith claims that it was the policeman's gun that had discharged the fatal round. The appeal is denied. The judge refuses to be lenient because a police officer has been shot and killed. Smith's execution is scheduled, then postponed. The process drags on for an entire year as his lawyer appeals unsuccessfully for the sentence to be commuted. Throughout those long, difficult months, Father McGivney visits Smith nearly every day, offering comfort and prayer. It must have been something for Father Mike to, to sit down with this person and try to break through and find the humanity that was underneath all of the, the hurt and the pain that this young fellow had gone through. As a parish priest, it was expected that Father McGivney would visit Chip Smith. What was unexpected, that he would do this every day and do this with the intense desire that when Chip Smith climbed the scaffold, he would do so reconciled with God. And Chip became a very deep, serious Christian through Father McGivney's influence. Eventually, he had a complete conversion. But ministering to the condemned man takes its toll on Father McGivney. As his priest, he is expected to stay with Smith up to his execution. Father McGivney would go day by day to visit him uh, in his cell when he was on uh, death row. He brought him, of course, the sacraments, he comforted him, he prepared him to die. He did not mind being identified as the friend of a prisoner on death row. And he did it in the midst 
of a thousand other things, arranging church picnics, trying to keep up with various parish organizations, a whole round of things. Father McGivney is deeply changed by counseling Smith. During Ship's last week, he spends most of each day with the condemned man. That night, Smith is calm and at peace. He's ready to accept his fate. The next morning, he goes to the gallows with great dignity. It is Friday, September 1st, 1882. last thing in the world Michael McGivney wanted to do was to be there for the execution, but felt that Chip Smith needed him more than ever, and so he gave him the last rites, and said that last mass for him, and he was there when he died. Father McGivney is painfully aware that Smith's fate could be the fate of many a young Catholic man who has no guidance and support. And all through this trying time, the growth of the Knights of Columbus is stalled. There are still only 27 members. It wasn't as if he met with a dozen men in the basement of St. Mary's Church in New Haven, and they all saluted and said, yes, sir. And then they went off, and the Knights became an overnight success story. There were difficulties. It just about died those first two years. There was tremendous bickering and infighting, and Father McGivney endured it all. With differences finally overcome, Father McGivney sends a letter to all of the other priests in the state, urging them to consider forming a council. And in March of 1883, he receives word from some Catholic men in nearby Meriden who have heard about the new organization and want to join. This could be a huge step forward, a move towards becoming a statewide organization. But Father McGivney delays a promised visit to Meriden. He is privately concerned. He knows that the pastor of the church in Meriden is skeptical about the idea of Catholic fraternal societies. It was only when they said, we'll go to the foresters and we'll ask them, that uh, he finally said, okay, all right, all right, fine, I'll come up to Meriden and we'll help make things happen. With McGivney's encouragement, the pastor in Meriden agrees and council number two is established in May of 1883. It was the founding of this council in Meriden that actually set the nights going. It took off, it took off like a shot. The dynamic between New Haven and Meriden started the whole thing rolling. The success in Meriden leads the way for councils across the state but the good news is tempered by a sad change for Father McGivney. After seven eventful years, he is told that he is leaving New Haven and getting his own parish. St. Mary's is packed when he celebrates his final mass at the church. There's been many reports of the parishioners crying during his final sermon. The man was deeply loved. I don't know how we got through that final sermon. But you look at all the people sitting there looking up at you. I don't know how he kept the tears back.
On November 12, 1884, Father McGivney leaves St. Mary's Church for a final time and heads towards the town of Thomaston, Connecticut, where he is to receive his own church and parish. That was a shock, I'm sure, to his system. I mean, he was the man of the hour in New Haven. Everybody knew him. He walked down the street, everybody knew him. Then he went to Thomaston, which is like nowhere. It's difficult for Father McGivney to leave New Haven, but this is really a promotion to him. It's a recognition of his great accomplishments at St. Mary's and presents him with new opportunities and new challenges. At Thomaston, Father McGivney throws himself into reviving the parish community. He was pastor in, in Thomaston here in Connecticut, and then uh, they gave him subsequently uh, the jurisdiction and duty to be pastor of a, a nearby parish. The responsibilities were doubled and so forth in a time when transportation wasn't too great. Shuffling and shuttling back and forth uh, between the two parishes and it wasn't easy. He had morning mass in one and then subsequent morning mass in another and then back for the third mass in the morning in, another, in, the, in the original parish. Through it all, Father McGivney remains quietly involved with the growth of the Knights of Columbus. And when they pay their very first death benefit in 1885, he is overjoyed. They are at last a financially creditable insurance organization, a salvation for Catholic families on the brink of bankruptcy, poverty, and destitution. Now Father McGivney can see that his great idea not only can work, but it does work. His great idea has become reality. But there are still great battles to be won in the face of prejudice and religious division. In New Haven, a family's tragedy will help Father McGivney build a bridge between two embattled communities. It is a story that began in 1883, two years before Father McGivney left St. Mary's. Dr. Edwin Harwood is the minister of the preeminent Protestant congregation in New Haven, Trinity Church. Trinity stands on the green next to Yale University. The wealthy Harwoods are at the very pinnacle of New England society. It would be difficult to overstate the degree to which the Protestant establishment in Connecticut, in New Haven, uh, looked up to Reverend Harwood and his position in the Episcopal Church. In early 1883, a rumor begins to circulate about the surprising behavior of Dr. Harwood's eldest daughter, 22-year-old Alita. The news makes the society columns in many of the leading Connecticut papers. Rumor has it that Alita has been seen attending services at St. Mary's Catholic Church. For her to go to St. Mary's Church for the services, for Mass, or for anything, really was a scandal. And it could be the source of great embarrassment for the church, for the family, for anybody connected with this. Alita Harwood presents Father McGivney with a great challenge. He doesn't want to turn away someone inquiring about the Catholic faith. At the same time, her father is one of the most prominent Protestant ministers in New England. So Father McGivney has to proceed very delicately. Her father was a rather stern man. He used religion as the, the stick to be people with, you know, and so it's in a way it's not too surprising that Alita would look for a religious experience that was a little less daunting and rigorous and old. Impressed by the gentle strength of Father McGivney's faith, Alita attends St. Mary's more and more and the two become close friends. Through her relationship with Father McGivney, she became convinced that she wanted to become a Catholic. Eventually, when the father realized what was going on, he opposed it very bitterly. He decided to send her off to Europe in hopes that that would cure her. Well, she came back from Europe and had decided by that point that she wanted to be a nun. Dr. Harwood is horrified. In an act of desperation, he sends Alita to Europe a second time, but his plan fails. Alita is still strong in her Catholic faith. When she returns, she contracts malaria. At first, the case isn't serious. 
she's well enough to help her younger sister, Honora, prepare for her wedding. The younger daughter was engaged to be married to a very prominent young man. She disappeared one day and went to New York and married someone else entirely. And so the house was in an uproar. News of the elopement makes the headlines. It is a terrible shock for the Harwood family, and especially for Alita. Her malaria takes a serious turn for the worse. She became gravely ill, and uh, it was apparent finally that she was going to die. In and out of consciousness, Alita calls for Father McGivney. Her parents refuse to summon the priest to come from Thomaston to visit her. They still can't accept that their daughter has become a Catholic. Even in a fever, Alita insists that Father McGivney comes to give her last rites. Her father simply didn't want to permit it. He finally relented. And Father McGivney came and uh, administered the last rites. Alita dies the next day. For two days, Dr. Harwood makes no plans for a funeral. He cannot accept that Alita has died a Catholic. Her father wouldn't allow there to be any Catholic funeral, even though she had become a Catholic. And so her father actually closed up the house. It was a kind of denial that she had died. She was kept in her bedroom, laid out. Things rather hung in the balance for a while, and it was Dr. Harwood's wife who finally had to approach Michael and McGivney and say, please come over, please help us uh, do the best thing for Alita. It is a measure of the pastoral qualities of Michael McGivney that he was able, under very difficult circumstances, sit down with Dr. Harwood and work out an arrangement whereby the funeral would be an Episcopal funeral, but Father McGivney would participate. Father McGivney wins the respect of the most influential Protestant minister in the region. With such great skills as a peacemaker, it's not surprising that Supreme Knight John Phelan turns to McGivney when the Knights hit a roadblock in 1888. Some Catholic men have set up a council in Providence, Rhode Island, but nobody joins. The Knights look to Father McGivney for help. The Knights of Columbus is now a successful organization in Connecticut. They are about to take the next step on a journey that is going to lead to becoming a successful national and even international organization. But to take that step, they need to help the guidance, the determination of Father McGivney. The problem with that is that that's a different diocese. And Father McGivney was extremely reluctant to go ahead and set something up without the approval of the bishop. It is an important test case for the Knights if they are to become a viable national organization. But there are problems. Despite the enthusiasm for creating the council there, they were not getting any recruits. Everybody was waiting for some indication from the bishop that it was okay. Then the challenge came when we had to go beyond the state of Connecticut and uh, we had to seek permission from all of the, the other bishops, the diocese of, uh, that we wished to expand into. Father McGivney travels to Rhode Island in December 1888. His first port of call, the offices of the Reverend Matthew Harkins, Bishop of Providence. The move into Rhode Island is a test of Father McGivney's diplomatic skills. He must go to a new bishop who doesn't know him, who doesn't know his organization, and convince this bishop to allow this new experiment into his diocese. McGivney explains the object of the order and how it is helping so many widows and orphans in Connecticut. Bishop Harkins considers the matter and then gives Father McGivney his blessing. McGivney has cleared the way for the Knights to grow in Rhode Island. 
and hopefully other states. Father McGivney's intervention in Providence is his last major effort for the Knights. The exhaustion that blighted the lives of Father Murphy and many other young priests of his generation at last catches up with Michael McGivney. His immune system is weak. In December of 1889, he comes down with influenza. In January, it becomes pneumonia. He went to Saratoga Springs. He went to New York to see a specialist. He did these things, and yet his health kept failing. Father McGivney dies on the morning of August 14, 1890, in his rectory at Thomaston, two days after his 38th birthday. A solemn requiem mass is held in his honor at St. Thomas's. A eulogy is given at his old church, St. Mary's, in New Haven. He was so loved by the people both in Thomaston and in New Haven that huge crowds, unprecedented crowds, showed up for his funeral to say goodbye to this wonderful man who had done so much in such a short life and who meant so much to the people of the parishes he served. As many Protestants came to the funeral of Michael McGivney as Catholics, he had touched a chord with the community. They buried him in a vault laid up meticulously with brick and two heavy two-inch bluestones. And this tells you that he was something special, that he was more than just the ordinary priest. McGivney is never to see his beloved Knights become a national organization. It does so in just a few years. At the time of McGivney's death, there were 6,000 Knights. Insurance benefits have been paid to 66 families, including McGivney's own two sisters. The Knights founder may be gone, but his vision will live on and reach far beyond the confines of New Haven, Connecticut and Rhode Island. Poor man only had 38 years of life, but God knows what he would have been able to accomplish had he lived longer because he was working under the influence of the Holy Spirit. He wasn't uh, foreseeing that he was going down in history. He just was doing the work of a simple priest. Today, the Knights of Columbus still has its headquarters in New Haven, Connecticut, less than a mile from Father McGivney's beloved St. Mary's. We've grown to 13,000 councils now. We've got 1,750,000 uh, members. That's male members. If we add the wives and children and the true family spirit to it, we're about four and a half to five billion members. It's twice the size of Ireland. Pope John Paul II was a great supporter of the Knights of Columbus. He called them at one point the strong right arm of the church. In recognition of the holy life he led and the inspiration he continues to spread through the Knights of Columbus, the Archbishop of Hartford began the process to canonize Father McGivney in 1997. If it is successful, he will become the first ever American-born parish priest to become a saint. I willingly gave a, a heartfelt endorsement to it and have done and will do anything I can uh, to, uh, to further this cause. For Father McGivney to be declared a saint, the postulator for his cause must prove he was a person of great virtue. There were over 700 pages of uh, documentation that had to be notarized. Then they had to be wrapped, and uh, sealing wax had to be put on them. And the archdiocesan seal was used on some. And this ring was used on the others because it has a signet. Uh, it's a signet ring. But the ultimate decision lies with the Pope, who waits for signs of God's intervention in the form of miracles. There have to be two, one before the beatification and the second before the canonization. And we have a reported miracle that we have submitted to the church. On March 15, 2008, the Vatican made a formal announcement declaring Father Michael McGivney to be a man of heroic virtue. It is a major step forward in his cause for sainthood. 
Should the Pope decide to canonize Father McGivney, it will be a powerful recognition of how much this simple priest from Connecticut achieved in his short, eventful life. He was just an ordinary parish priest, but he touched so many lives. Today, Father McGivney remains the guiding light, the model for nights everywhere, and we're very proud to be part of his legacy. eternal city and center of the Roman Catholic faith, a universal symbol that unites the world, including members of a fraternal organization founded in the United States, the Knights of Columbus. Since 1920, the Knights have stood by the popes and the people of Rome through war and political upheaval, through times of hunger and moments of joy. From building playgrounds for the youth of Rome, to building bridges through diplomacy, from restoring precious Vatican art, to funding the satellite transmissions of papal events, the Knights of Columbus have stayed true to the vision of their founder, Father Michael McGivney. Today, with 1.8 million members in 13 different countries, the Knights of Columbus is the largest Catholic fraternal organization in the world. Impressive growth for an organization with humble roots. In 19th century America, Catholic immigrants began arriving in droves. They were not always welcomed into American society. One of the perennial questions in the 19th century was concerning whether the immigrant coming to America from Catholic countries could be faithful Catholics and at the same time loyal Americans. Catholics were often ostracized in communities across the United States. Their churches were burned or graffitied. You really are dealing with a, a, a visceral anti-Catholicism. But even without this prejudice and fear from the Protestant majority, the Catholic immigrant population was already in a state of crisis. 
They're working in the most difficult jobs, the most dangerous jobs. People get tuberculosis, people have industrial accidents, people have heart attacks, they drop dead. So this is long before unions. This is long before workers' compensation. This is long before any kind of safety net exists. Catholics were also barred membership in many mutual benefit societies, meaning husbands and fathers had no means of protecting their family in the event of an untimely death. Many widows found themselves and their children doomed to destitution and ruin. If you could not support your children, the law, the probate court would come in and take your children and farm them out. They would literally take children away. It is exactly this dismal situation that prompted a young priest into action. Venerable servant of God, Father Michael McGivney, was the pastor at St. Mary's Church in New Haven, Connecticut. He was deeply concerned about the pressures tearing apart Catholic immigrant families. On October 2nd, 1881, he called a meeting of local Catholic men in the basement of his church. He shared with them his vision of a Catholic fraternal group bound by the spiritual principles of charity and unity. Columbus in the 19th century was a hero in America, highly regarded as an explorer, as someone courageous. The Knights of Columbus wanted to build on that image uh, for themselves. Our first Supreme Knight, James Mullen, then suggested the word Knights because he wanted to emphasize the knightly virtues, uh, standing for social justice, defending the poor and the helpless. Father McGivney had a revolutionary idea, really, uh, and that was that one could have a lay Catholic organization that was supportive of the church, but separate from it, and that it would prosper and grow and accomplish wonderful things by being separate but supportive. And Father McGivney's vision spread quickly as Catholic men were drawn to this new fraternal organization. Within 25 years of the founding, we had councils in every single state of the Union and nearly all of the provinces of Canada, and, uh, and had councils as well in Mexico and in the Philippines. And the Knights became chief defenders of Catholics in that time period. So all these newly arrived immigrants saw the Knights as protection, protection against prejudice. And that was a very, very powerful lure. But when America declared war on Germany in 1917, Knights of Columbus would be called to protect more than their Catholic brethren. There was a lot of belief among some sectors of the country that Catholics weren't too interested in fighting this war. Why? Well, because a lot of Catholics were German, and here we are fighting Germany. An overwhelming number of Catholics were Irish-American. We're going to fight with the British, the British who have done all this to the Irish, not only do thousands of Catholics serve courageously in battle, the Knights of Columbus also expanded their charitable work during the war. At the request of President Woodrow Wilson, the Knights created recreation centers for soldiers. These popular places of rest and relaxation came to be known as KC huts. 150 huts were set up across Europe, including at the famous Hotel Minerva in Rome. The theme was everybody welcome, everything free. So men could come in and have uh, a smoke with some friends, play cards, write a letter to their families, and have the wholesome kind of camaraderie of their uh, fellows that they were working with at the time. It was important to us to show that our notion of unity transcended political differences, political boundaries, the World War I huts earned the Knights of Columbus respect and admiration from returning veterans and the general public. The Knights were also greatly appreciated in France, where the majority of the huts had been located. In 1920, a delegation of 235 Knights, led by Supreme Knight James Flaherty, traveled to France as guests of honor. The French were extremely grateful for all that the Knights of Columbus had done, and they invited them to visit France. 
Then, having traveled across the ocean, they said, we're already here, let's go to the Vatican. Pope Benedict saw the impact of the Casey's of the Knights of Columbus Hut Movement. A delegation of Knights went over to the Vatican, and the Pope said, this really works, and you were extraordinarily successful. I want you to do some stuff in Rome for me. In quell'occasione, i cavalieri di Colombo. And on that occasion, the Knights of Columbus asked the Pope, Your Holiness, what can we do for you? And the Pope said, I am here in the Vatican, but do something for my children of Rome. Per i miei ragazzi di Roma. Benedict XV saw the problems politically that were developing in Italy at the time, and he wanted the young people to be under a good Catholic influence. He had great respect for the Knights of Columbus. Benedict XV was aware of what the Knights had done for soldiers during the First World War, and uh, the, the good influence that they had had in that way. And he was aware of the marvelous activities of the Knights in the United States. He had great respect for the Knights of Columbus, which is why he invited them to do this. To begin their charitable work in Italy, the Knights decided to construct playgrounds for the youth of Rome. From that beginning, eventually, five playgrounds would be constructed. These playgrounds were and remain free for everyone. The playground project required working closely with not just the Vatican, but with the city of Rome. Past Supreme Knight, Edward Hearn, was dispatched to make sure construction of the new playgrounds ran smoothly. But Hearn spoke no Italian and had limited contacts. A chance meeting with Enrico Galeazzi, a successful Roman architect, would change his fortunes. Galeazzi was hired by Edward Hearn to be the chief designer of the new playgrounds. Between 1923 and 1927, the Knights of Columbus opened five athletic centers in Rome. In those times, before the Knights, there were very few playgrounds in Rome. In those times, the Knights of Columbus were the only way to play sports in Rome, free of charge. They were the link. I would say the only one that allowed us to have these playgrounds to exist. Because Rome was not in a position to build playgrounds, both because of the economic conditions and the lack of organization. My memory is that there was a lot of envy at those who had access to the playgrounds during busy periods. Rome did not have many playgrounds, therefore it was a real privilege to have the playgrounds here. The rise of fascism in Italy presented challenges for the Knights of Columbus in Rome. In 1931, Mussolini nationalized the playgrounds, forcing them to close briefly. However, after several months of negotiations, Enrico Galeazzi successfully negotiated a reopening under Knights of Columbus control. Questi campi dei Cavalieri di Colombo hanno continuato a funzionare. These playgrounds of the Knights of Columbus continue to function during the fascist era, when no organization could function unless they formed part of a fascist youth organization. Not even the Boy Scouts or Catholic Action. Only the Knights of Columbus playgrounds were allowed to function. And even during the Second World War, the playgrounds in Rome remained open. I campi dei cavalieri in Roma restarono aperti. You need to remember that the Americans were the enemy. Yet, they continued peacefully as a uniquely non-fascist organization during a fascist era. 
It was very important. non fascista in epoca fascista. È stato molto importante. While the Knights were contending with a hostile fascist government in Italy, their work around the world, especially in Mexico, was being honored by Pope Pius XI. The Pope issued an encyclical calling for peaceful resistance to the Mexican government's anti-Catholic violence and praising the Knights for defending the faith in Mexico. Leaders of the Knights of Columbus met with President Coolidge. Their pressure helped change Washington's hands-off policy, leading to an end to the Mexican conflict in 1929. Despite gaining influence and respect internationally, the Knights of Columbus still struggled against prejudice at home. Knight of Columbus Al Smith faced a resurgent KKK and opposition to his faith during his 1928 presidential campaign. And anti-Catholicism was the principal reason there had been no formal diplomatic relations between the United States and the Vatican since the time of the Civil War. But Knights of Columbus representative in Rome, Enrico Galeazzi, helped bridge that divide. He was a very close friend of the future Cardinal Spellman. He also spoke English very well. And during that time, very few people in Italy spoke the language. He had a lot of advantages because of this knowledge. He also forged a close relationship with the Vatican, thanks in part to his relationship with Monsignor Pacelli, who later became Pope Pius XII. In 1936, Vatican Secretary of State Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli visited the United States with his trusted advisor, Enrico Galeazzi. Their trip included a visit to the Knights of Columbus headquarters in New Haven, Connecticut. Three years later, Pacelli was elected Pope Pius XII. He chose Galeazzi to be his governor of Vatican City. Count Enrico Galeazzi was a great man because what he did for the Pope was the work of at least seven or eight people. Certainly for Galeazzi and the nephew of the Pope, the opportunity to meet with him on a daily basis gave them the ability to influence the Pope and also to learn about new initiatives that were ongoing. Those of us of a certain age used to call them the third branch of the Secretariat of State. With the beginning of the Second World War, communication between the Pope and the U.S. government became increasingly important. Galeazzi's vast contacts, thanks in part to his close relationship with the Knights of Columbus, would prove invaluable. It was strategically important that we have some ex parte communication with the Vatican, so having him there was extremely useful in passing communications back and forth between our countries. And the Knights of Columbus, uh, once again, gave a, you know, a good, credible uh, cover for that to go on. In fact, this contact allowed a relationship that did not exist at that moment. It couldn't exist due to diplomatic and political reasons. Therefore, we have to call this relationship providential in helping from the beginning both Rome and also the Vatican. Because the lack of communication, this relationship was helpful for both Rome and the Vatican. At no point did this new partnership prove more useful than in the summer of 1943, as British and American troops invaded Italy from the south. A bombing campaign targeted Rome's military supply centers. On July 19th, there were 112 bombers that dropped 956 bombs. Around 1,500 people were killed, so it was an event that deeply wounded the city of Rome and the Romans. The Pope decided immediately to leave the Vatican, something which did not happen frequently at that time, and to go to St. Lawrence Quarter. He asked for the car, and they responded that they did not have gasoline, 
that they were not prepared to take him. So Galeazzi offered to take him in his car. And so he had a little topolino, and he took the Pope in his car. At St. Lawrence, there are some very beautiful images of the Pope as the pastor Angelicus, invoking God's assistance for those who were suffering. It was clearly a very important and very touching moment. He was the Bishop of Rome, reaching out to his people who were suffering. I saw the car of the Pope arrive, the Pope got out of his car, and all the people gathered around him. He presented himself, first of all, to comfort the people, to pray with them, bless them, but also to assist them with material needs. He arrived there with money that was provided to the victims. The Pope returned to the Vatican with his white tunic covered in blood. There is a letter that Pope Pius sent to President Roosevelt during the years of the war, looking to forge an armistice with the Americans. This letter was bought by my grandfather under aerial bombardment, facing many difficulties for precisely President Roosevelt through Cardinal Spellman. The letter never got to Roosevelt, but he got the message. The Allies never bombed Rome again. Pius XII's appeals helped spare Rome from further bombing, but the city still faced widespread poverty and food shortages. St. Peter's Oratory, one of the Knights of Columbus playgrounds, became headquarters of the Vatican's food distribution program, feeding upwards of 400,000 people daily. Following the liberation of Rome, the Knights of Columbus worked with the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration and other organizations to aid in the distribution of food, especially to children at a time when there were severe shortages and many were going hungry. They prepared packs with supplies, food, flour, bread, etc. They helped a great deal economically with the construction of Italian cities not just Rome, but beyond as well. And whoever was in need knew that they could ask for help. The Knights became really well known after the war for helping children of the slums, especially with the soccer fields, because soccer was by far the most popular sport, and it was really the best vehicle for reaching the youth. The memories that stay with me and that come to mind are beautiful ones that have deep meaning and significance to my career as a soccer player and as a man. The beautiful thing is that I used to play at the parish and my father did not know of anything beyond the tryout that I had. And so he did not know if this would be a good environment. But when he learned of the Knights of Columbus, that it was a Catholic organization that helped young people, those with special needs, my father knew that he had sent me to a safe place. And so my life basically began there. So many young people who went on to successful careers credit the Knights of Columbus with important life lessons. In 1944, I went to the Knights of Columbus, and it was a salvation, not just for that summer. It was a place that became a reference point for games, for meeting people, for forging friendships. I used to invite all my friends, lawyers, town councillors, members of parliament, and also a doorman. You understand, the knights were transcending class divisions.
In the years following the Second World War, the Knights commit themselves to the preservation of the very heart of the Eternal City. St. Peter's represents a profound center for the city of Rome, and the enormous line of pilgrims that always exists gives testimony to this truth. In the 1940s, the Knights joined forces with the Vatican and Hollywood filmmaker Samuel Bronston, filming the excavations of the Vatican necropolis, or Scavi. It was our great privilege during the work of the Scavi to be in part responsible for the historical record that was made during that time. In 1951, the Knights of Columbus funded the Vatican Microfilm Library at St. Louis University, beginning the most ambitious microfilming project ever undertaken up to that time. With the explosion in global communications in the second half of the 20th century, the Knights of Columbus helped the Vatican utilize these new means of communication. In 1975, the Knights agreed to fund the satellite transmission of major Vatican events. We've done that for the Christmas Midnight Mass, the Easter Week service, the funerals of the popes, we've done that. And We've done the, uh, the installation masses the Holy Father been brought. For many countries, that signal would not have reached them without the help of the Knights of Columbus. The Knights of Columbus expanded their support of satellite transmissions during the pontificate of Pope John Paul II. In 1985, the Knights assisted the Vatican in the purchase of a mobile TV production van. Pope John Paul II's partnership with the Knights also extended to his lifelong battle against communism. The Holy Father launched a program that was with him till the day he died, and that's the common Christian roots of Europe. He asked us to sponsor, provide some resources, particularly for the Europeans that were coming from East Europe. Thereby, the Holy Father thought that by uniting Europe, he could reach his ultimate goal. Ronald Reagan and John Paul II had a great community of interest. Remember, they were practically the only people in the world who believed that the Soviet Union not only should fall apart, but that it would. We hope and we pray today for a time when the people of Poland and all of the peoples on earth will join the people of America in celebrating the joys of freedom and speak together in pride and dignity of the wheat that grows on stones. God bless you and thank you very much. At our 100th anniversary convention in Hartford, uh, President Reagan came and addressed our delegates. Also, the Vatican Secretary of State, Cardinal Casaroli, was there and the president and the cardinal had a private meeting in which groundwork was laid to move forward with this diplomatic relationship between the United States and the Holy See. It's not just about diplomacy. This is about human rights. This is about civil rights. This is about social and economic justice. Everybody wins. You know, the White House wins, the Vatican wins. I think the Knights have been very useful to U.S. Vatican relations because everywhere they turn up it's a positive event and it's it's a reflection of the generosity of the American people through the Knights of Columbus. The message of our popes has always consistently been a message of hope, brotherhood, respect for diversity, helping the poor, uh, looking out for human rights and so that's a message every Catholic needs but everyone in the world needs that message. Dal 1980 in poi from 1980 on, the KFC began collaborating in a unique way with St. Peter's in financing the restoration of works in need of repair. So we sponsored projects that were truly epic. 
for example, the restoration of the facade of St. Peter's in 1985. You could say the first restoration gave the touch of youth to the facade, and it was greeted with great admiration by all. When we look at St. Peter's Basilica, we see, of course, the most magnificent building ever created by mankind. We see one of the great works of art, the great patrimony of humanity. But when the Catholic faithful looks at St. Peter's Basilica, we see something more. We see this great edifice which is a testimony to the early regard that the church had for the Prince of the Apostles, St. Peter. The first persecutor of the church no longer exists. The tomb of a poor fisherman mowed down by this ferocious emperor became instead a magnet, drawing together the entire world. The persecutor is finished. The martyr lives on. Over the years, the Knights have continued funding important restorations, including the statues of Saints Peter and Paul on the steps of St. Peter's and the Moderno Atrium leading into the Basilica. This restoring the temple gives to the whole world this message of rejuvenation, that the entire world must continually return to God with an always growing need and enthusiasm, thus always with a younger face. Some of the greatest works of spiritual beauty and creativity that humanity has produced is in the safeguarding hands of the Vatican. Knights have felt very proud that we've had the opportunity to help preserve and enhance what really is a patrimony of humanity. In Rome, the Knights continue to serve the Universal Church in the spirit of its founder. Ninety years have passed since the Knights of Columbus first met with Pope Benedict XV. They continue to stand with the Holy Father. And through the years, the Vatican has learned to really trust the Knights of Columbus. I believe the secret of our success is best right in that word, trust. It's said that there is no sermon more powerful than a strong man on his knees. And I think the fact that you have millions of strong men on their knees with their families is a marvelous witness in the world today. We go where the church wants us to go. So in my opinion, the future will be that which the church asks us to do. We will always be right by their side. The church can always count on the Knights of Columbus. I think the Knights of Columbus has been a great gift to the city of Rome. I'm convinced that Rome's Catholic identity is extremely important. And this is what you do every day, expressing the values of the Catholic Church and Christianity. But I also believe that your experience can serve our city in giving us different points of view and allowing us to become more international. Well, Knights of Columbus are very proud of our long relationship with the city of Rome and the opportunity that we have had to assist in works of charity and building relationships with each new generation of Italians by providing for youth athletics on our field. We also are very proud of the fact that that relationship has gone forward uninterrupted, regardless of an economic situation, a political situation, even in times of war, we have been able to say